Students and family members, administrators, faculty, and staff, I am greatly honored to be here today and appreciate the opportunity to address you. Two weeks ago, Vicki and I were in Washington, D.C., attending the Portrait Society of America conference with seven of my illustration students on an experiential learning trip. Our students represented us so well. Vicki and I were in Rome last year, which included a visit to the Vatican Museum and an opportunity to view the Sistine Chapel. Speaking of the painting and its creator, Michelangelo, President Spencer W. Kimball stated in his Education for Eternity, Vision of the Arts Address, 50 years ago. His 3,500 square foot painting in the Sistine Chapel is said to be the most important piece of mural painting of the modern world. To be an artist, said President Kimball, or a scientist or a mathematician could be added, means hard work and patience and long suffering. Michelangelo said, I am a poor man and of little merit who plods along in the art which God gave me. His David in Florence and his Moses in Rome inspire to adulation, said President Kimball. A recent exhibition entitled Michelangelo, Divine Draftsman and Designer was displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Eight years in the making, the exhibit included 133 drawings, which was the largest group of drawings by Michelangelo ever assembled, ever assembled for public display. Among the drawings exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum is a single page of studies Michelangelo drew for the Libyan Sibyl, a page I often show and display for my life drawing students. Sibyls at the time were considered to have equal status to that of the prophets. Historically, drawings did not exist as standalone entities, but rather as preparatory studies for more monumental work. Of drawing, Michelangelo stated, let this be plain to all, design, or as it is called by another name, drawing, constitutes the fountainhead and substance of painting and sculpture and architecture and is the root of all sciences. Let him who has attained the possession of this be assured that he possesses a great treasure. One wonders, were his statement made today, if it wouldn't also include the disciplines of animation, digital painting, and graphic design. In his letters and poetry, Michelangelo reveals a sensitive spirit and an individual who loved and revered God. In Michelangelo's opinion, it was God who bestowed all talents and abilities. His were no exception. Despite his self-assurance, he also experienced bouts of insecurity and great conflicts within himself related to his desire to attain perfection in his work. Shortly before his death, Michelangelo burned hundreds of his drawings, sketches, and cartoons a self-inflicted bonfire to mediocrity in an effort to conceal the ways in which he labored to realize his genius. In my life drawing classes, I encourage students to make master copies of different artists, not so much as an exercise to fill their sketchbooks with good drawings as an exercise for making valuable observations about the work of the artist they select. Historically accomplished artists have always stood on the shoulders of greatness. Norman Rockwell was no exception. In his 1943 cover for the Saturday Evening Post, Rockwell pays homage to Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel figure of Isaiah in his portrayal of Rosie the Riveter. Over the course of World War II, millions of women left their homes to fill a manpower shortage, building bombs, tanks, planes, and a myriad of other necessary items. To do so, they had to overcome the perception that they were physically not up to the task. Rockwell's heroic Rosie seems more than equal to the task. In November of 2015, our illustration students were invited to the opening night of the Norman Rockwell American Chronicle show exhibited at the BYU Museum of Art. Ruby Bridges, the little girl pictured in this painting, was guest speaker at the opening. In her remarks, she stated that she felt very privileged to have been painted by Norman Rockwell. She told the audience he took a lot of flack for that painting. She continued, I was six years old at the time. I integrated an all-white school and had no idea what was going on. I thought I was going to college. <laughs> Later, it became evident to me that my story was bigger than I was, and I came to grips with that. Ruby explained that her story became valuable, especially as it became a source of inspiration to other children trying to do hard things. 
One little girl told me, you are so brave. I had to be brave like you when I called the police because my dad was beating my mom. In 1964, when he painted The Problem We All Live With, Norman Rockwell had left the Saturday Evening Post and begun working for Look Magazine. This painting was his first assignment. Rockwell did multiple studies for the illustration, only one of which is pictured. The process of making sketches, tonal studies, and color comprehensives is a long-standing tradition for artists extending back for centuries. Similarly, dress rehearsals in music, theater, and dance have become an integral part of securing a successful public performance. I love the scripture found in Doctrine and Covenants 3830, if ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. Or as President Monson often remarked, when the time for performance arrives, the time for preparation is past. In 1965, Rockwell completed the painting Murder in Mississippi. In this work, Rockwell illustrated the Philadelphia, Mississippi slaying of civil rights workers Michael Schwerner, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney. He did his due <coughs> normal diligence in creating multiple preparatory tonal and color studies. But in this case, Look Magazine decided to run the color study instead of the final art, believing that it communicated more emotion than the final painting. Another important principle for artists and illustrators in the preparation of their creative work involves the opportunity to have personal experiences with the subject being portrayed. Several years ago, Vicki and additional members of my family had the opportunity to visit Israel and Jerusalem. We were able to visit many historic sites, including the Mount of Olives, where Orson Hyde had dedicated the Holy Land for the gathering of Judah and the rearing of a temple. Up well before dawn, Orson climbed the Mount of Olives, built an altar, and with pen and paper in hand, recorded the prayer of dedication previously given to him by revelation. One morning while there, Vicki and I were also up before dawn and witnessed a beautiful sunrise that became part of the inspiration for this later painting. The British philosopher Roger Scruton in a BBC program entitled Why Beauty Matters stated that through beauty we are brought into the presence of the sacred. He continued, philosophers have argued that through the pursuit of beauty we shape the world as a home. We also come to understand our own nature as spiritual beings. In his book entitled The Greater Journey, two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning author David McCullough wrote about LDS artists. A group of aspiring young Mormon painters who called themselves art missionaries arrived in Paris from Utah, many to enroll in the Academy Julien. Their expenses were being provided by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in return for work they would later contribute painting murals in the, in the temple in Salt Lake City. As one of their leaders, an especially gifted painter named John Hafen said, their motivation was the belief that the highest possible development of talent is the duty we owe our Creator. In the spring of 1890, John Hafen and fellow artist Loris Pratt visited George Q. Cannon, who was then a member of the First Presidency, with a proposal that the LDS Church call and fund them, together with artist John Fairbanks, on an art mission to Paris. They explained their need for additional training and also expressed a commitment to contribute their subsequently acquired skills to the creation of murals for the Salt Lake Temple. To quote John Hafen, I made it a matter of prayer for many years that he would open a way whereby I could receive that training which would benefit me to decorate his holy temples and the habitations of Zion. Hafen and Pratt and Fairbanks hiked Ensign Peak and offered a prayer that their proposal might be granted. It was accepted, and on June 3rd of that year, they were set apart as missionaries with a special purpose. Their departure for Paris occurred on June 23rd, Edwin Evans became the fourth art missionary departing in September, and Herman Hogg followed shortly after as the fifth missionary. Upon returning, these artists created murals for the Salt Lake, Karsten, Alberta, and Mesa Temples. A collection of donated paintings by John Hafen became the initial basis for the Springville Museum of Art. In an interview, President Boyd K. Packer referenced the art missionaries who aspired to create art for temples. He stated that, 
feeling inspired as an artist was not enough, that talent and inspiration needed to be backed up with training and experience so that the work created would be credible. He said that the training of great artists, writers, and musicians means, in part, that they need to learn what the world has to teach. In Paris, the best art educational center in the world at that time, they were not just taught how to paint, but they were also exposed to the work of the great masters. The art missionaries came to understand through their diligent search for learning that it took a great deal of energy and time to acquire the skill and knowledge they sought. Sacrifice and patience became important components in their quest for learning. Oliver Cowdery learned an important lesson as he desired to translate the ancient record inscribed on the gold plates. His desires were admirable, but his attempts to translate were not successful. His failure may have been a consequence of undertaking the process with insufficient effort. The Lord told Oliver, Behold, you have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it to you when you took no thought, save it were to ask me. Oliver learned that the Lord never does for his children what they can do for themselves. Doing so would deny his children the opportunity to learn and to grow from their own experience, which is one of the fundamental purposes of mortality. As children, our heavenly fa children of our Heavenly Father, we must make more effort than to simply ask Him. We must put forth effort and prepare before He can guide us. To Oliver, the Lord outlined the action He expected him to take, which was to study it out in your mind and then ask me if it be right. For an artist, this might sound like draw it out in your own mind, and then confirm the correct direct direction. This statement suggests that the Lord expects His children to do their homework on a problem, consider the options, and then make a decision. Then and only then are they able to take their decisions to the Lord and ask Him if what they have decided to do is right. In the Gospel of John we read, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. It seems we will only receive a testimony of tithing by paying our tithing. We will only know the Book of Mormon is true after reading it and praying about it. We will only know if the course we are pursuing is correct by first choosing it and then asking God if we are on the right course. Regarding the principle of learning by doing, David McCullough remarked, the great thing about the arts is that the only way you learn how to do it is by doing it. You can't learn to play the piano without playing the piano. You can't learn to write without writing. And in many ways, you can't learn to think without thinking. At a BYU devotional, President Hinckley remarked, Work is the miracle by which talents rise to the surface and dreams become a reality. Several years ago, when President Irene was serving as the Church Commissioner of Education, I had the opportunity to sit on the stand with him. While our dean at the time was delivering his remarks, I noticed that President Irene appeared to be taking notes in a small book which he carried with him. Following the devotional, I commended him for his diligence, and he responding by, responded by asking, Do you want to see what I was doing? He opened up what was a small sketchbook, and to my surprise and delight, quickly showed me some of the images he had been drawing. I often tell my students they will know if they are artists if they can observe and draw feel and draw, and think and draw. In graduate school, I, encouraged several different ex I encountered several different experiences that were challenging for me. One of those experiences involved an initial review for my master's degree where I was asked to stand on stage and defend my work to the entire art department faculty. I don't believe I was very articulate or persuasive at the time because I failed to pass the review. That experience was extremely disappointing to me and to Vicki, especially after we had encountered the challenge of moving 1,200 miles away and were scrimping to pay out-of-state tuition. But rejection caused me to dig deeper and pushed me outside my comfort zone. Through additional research, I became exposed to different points of view and different philosophies and was able to understand the context of criticism leveled at a large body of representational work. I also came to realize why it was possible to be drawn toward figurative work and develop a justification for doing so. Research allowed me to develop an informed justification and critical theory for what I was drawing, drawn to and wanted to be exploring as an artist. 
My work became more than rendering and began to include interpretation and concept. My own experiences were projected into the work and it also became more personal and symbolic. I think it ultimately became more interesting and I passed my second review. I routinely, I routinely tell my students that if they want to progress rapidly in the gaining of new skills and different ways of seeing, they must be willing to leave their comfort zones and work on the very edge of their capabilities. They must be willing to take risks, fail, and try again. But unlike skydiving, I assure them that they do get more than one opportunity. <laughs> on one occasion, Elder Richard G. Scott describes his visit to and fascination with an artist who happened to be the husband of his wife's friend. He was impressed with the work he saw and he wondered if it would be possible for him to be able to create similar paintings. With some trepidation, Elder Scott bought an art book, read it, bought some paints, and painted a watercolor. He states, the results even viewed charitably were not good. <laughs> he then talks about the temptation to quit or give up. However, he decided to pursue his ambition. He purchased better materials, he received instruction, and he was introduced to a number of master artists. He was rewarded by having one of his paintings juried into an art competition and having another one purchased. Regarding his experience, Elder Scott wrote, search for feelings that prompt you to try something new. Otherwise, you may never enter the doors it opens to insight, enjoyment, and wonder. Every individual has creative capacity. The satisfaction and growth creativity generates is intended for each of us, but trying takes courage. Believe in yourself, continued Elder Scott. Doubt destroys creativity, while faith strengthens it. As you experiment with new things, you will discover a great deal about yourself that likely won't be revealed in any other way. Following the completion of my graduate degree, I received a grant to complete a year of postgraduate work in Berlin, Germany. Spending a year in Berlin with a young family was not an easy experience. It did, however, end up being a very consequential experience. The City Colleges of Chicago had an extension in Berlin, and it was there that I had my first college teaching experience. I also had access to some of the great art of Europe, including several works by Rembrandt at the Dahlem Gallery. We were able to travel to other museums in East Berlin, as well as in Italy, the Netherlands, England, and Denmark. While teaching at the Tempelhof Air Force Base, I learned more about the Berlin Airlift and became aware of the story of Gail Halverson, the Mormon candy bomber. Little did I realize at that time that I would much later be illustrating this, this story, Christmas from Heaven. At a later book signing, I had the opportunity to meet Hal for the first time. I've been wanting to meet you for a long time, I said. He responded, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time as well. <laughs> I related to him how we had lived in Berlin and that I had taught classes at the air base there. I had learned more about the airlift and his story but never imagined I would be illustrating it one day. He told me his father used to say, out of small things come great things, to which I responded, that sounds almost scriptural. He responded, well, you and I both know that it is. Another important children's book, Silent Night, Holy Night, which I was fortunate to illustrate, portrayed the story of the 1914 Christmas truce that took place during World War I. On Christmas Day that year, combatants on both sides of the conflict laid down their arms for a brief period and joined in singing carols and remembering the Prince of Peace. Don Mullen, an author, film producer, and human rights leader, organized a centennial to commemorate that truce, the truce that took place at a church, uh, the Church of St. Nicholas at Messines, Belgium in 2014. He contacted me to request permission to use the illustrations from my book as part of a permanent exhibition in the crypt of St. Nicholas. The purpose of the exhibition was not only to commemorate the Christmas truce, but to create a place of pilgrimage for all lovers of peace and reconciliation in the world. Don Mullen grew up in Derry, Ireland, and was 15 years old when British soldiers killed 27 unarmed civilians in his city. He was filled with anger and almost joined the IRA, but told me God was watching over him because the night he was to join, his sponsor did not show up. John chose the path of peace instead and later wrote and produced a number of documentaries on the Irish Civil War. 
He traveled to BYU a few years ago and spoke to students and faculty in our department. Through his work as a writer and filmmaker, Don was in a unique position to communicate his intimate vision to our students and to me. As we walked across campus, he was ever curious, asking about each place and activity we encountered. He gave me the opportunity to see not only through his eyes, but also through his thoughts and his emotions. Toward the conclusion of his visit at BYU, he wrote a message to a dear friend. I wish you could be here with me over these sacred days at Brigham Young University. As you know, I have over my lifetime been to many campuses, but I have never had this profound sense of the sacred before. The Mormon people I have had the privilege of meeting on this visit are deeply and profoundly Christian. It has been a deep spiritual privilege to have been blessed with the grace of walking among them. Don is a Roman Catholic, but helped me see the surprising beauty and spirituality that was in front of me here at BYU and helped me celebrate that which I might otherwise have passed by without noticing. It has been said that the source of interesting pictures is life and that life is a function of your experience. Your experience is your life. The type of experience that is most influential to artists and illustrators was, as well as their audience is visual. Illustrators are visual storytellers, and the word illustration derives from the Latin illustrare, which means to illuminate or make bright. Historically, the Bible and other important books and manuscripts had their stories illuminated with letters, designs, and paintings. In her book entitled The Shelter of Each Other, clinical psychologist Mary Pfeiffer wrote, writes, I am an advocate for more stories, not fewer. I like to hear that extended family, neighbors, old people, people from different backgrounds, poets, teachers, and children are telling stories to each other. Everyone has stories to tell. Stories are about imagination and hope. They are, to quote poet William Stafford, about discovering what the world is trying to be. Elder and Sister Oak spoke about the importance of stories at the Family Discovery Day at Roots Tech in February of this year. Family stories count. Children should know that they belong to something bigger than themselves, said President Oaks. A recent study by a university in the South concludes persuasively that if you want a happier family, create, refine, and retell the stories of your ancestors. Emphasize their ability to persist through adversity. That act alone will increase the odds that your family will thrive for many generations to come. Author David McCullough adds, all history is family history. And as Isaac Dennison stated, to be a person is to have a story to tell. Stories are a way to preserve our history and culture passing it along in a form that's easy for others to remember, including the next generation. Stories help us explore possibilities. I loved the Wi-Fi password we were given on our recent trip in one hotel, adventure. One of the most basic functions of a story is to teach and when we <coughs> is to teach, and when we tell stories about ourselves, we are imagining our possibilities and hopefully helping, other, helping ourselves choose the best ones. Stories bind us together and reveal our humanity. In a best-selling book on art education, author Sam Adequay stated, all students have what it takes to turn their artistic abilities into the realization of their dreams, but what is needed for things to happen is hidden until they search for it. All students, he continued, have the potential to become as good as they envision themselves capable of becoming. Earlier this year, we were able to host award-winning illustrator Jerry Pinckney. One of the greatest blessings of our students and faculty has been our visiting lecturer program. We are so grateful for the resources BYU and generous donors have provided to make this a possibility. Jerry Pinckney grew up in a segregated neighborhood of Philadelphia in a small home with two parents and five siblings. Drawing became his private space. He was not able to join certain organizations because of his race or go to certain places. His mother read to her children both fables, legends, folk tales, and told stories of African and African-American culture. Jerry was dyslexic but came to love literature. 
He became passionate about drawing, which was easier for him, and he routinely showed his creative work to his teachers to demonstrate that he was interested in learning. When he began his career, he was told there was no opportunity for African Americans in children's books, but he persisted and now is both illustrating and writing his own stories. In 1995, he was awarded a Caldecott Honor Award for his children's book, John Henry. To our students, he said, I am a storyteller at heart. For me, stories transformed my everyday life. They sparked my curiosity and provided an escape from a crowded environment. Deal with hard things, he said. Challenge the status quo and your own prejudices. Embrace your limitations. Be willing to take risks. Continue to grow. You will grow if you want to grow. There are many stories yet unborn, writes Mary Pfeiffer. The best stories are stories that help us see the complexities faced by others. We need stories to connect us with each other, stories to heal the polarization that can overwhelm us all, and stories to calm those who are frightened and who hate. These stories would offer us the possibility of reconciliation. We need stories that teach children empathy and accountability, how to act and how to be. Children are hungry for stories that help them feel hopeful and energetic. She continues, good stories have the power to save us. Reality is full of cautionary tales, heroes and difficult obstacles overcome through persistence. The best resource against the world's stupidity, meanness, and despair is simply telling the truth with all of its ambiguity and complexity. We all can make a difference by simply sharing our own stories with real people in real times and places. On my mission in Germany, I was able to meet and teach a young art history student who was studying at the Free University in Berlin. After baptizing her, she made it known to me that she was one of those spoken about in my patriarchal blessing. I returned to Berlin five years after my mission, and Vicky and I were able to spend time with Dorina and her family, who she had introduced to the church. We had two daughters and were expecting our third child at the time. The Demariuses had two sons when we were expecting their third child. Vicky and Dorina delivered within a week of each other. In a letter written to me after my mission, Dorina described how the artist Michelangelo believed in the principle of eternal progression. She informed me that, through her studies, she had learned he believed that the ultimate destiny of the human race was to attain a position that was like unto God. He said, the mind, the soul, becomes ennobled by the endeavor to create something perfect, for God is perfection, and whoever strives after perfection is striving for something divine. All of the individuals I have mentioned had the courage and motivation to endure hard things and experience great achievement. Michelangelo was beaten as a child by both his father and his uncle when they discovered him drawing, but went on to accomplish some of the world's greatest masterpieces. Norman Rockwell was criticized for his civil rights paintings. Angry letters referred to him as a hypocrite, and one re letter referred to his painting as vicious, lying propaganda being used for the crime of racial integration. Today he is an artist known by most people, and his name is synonymous with optimism and goodwill. Ruby Bridges integrated an all-white school and later lost a son to gun violence. Her story has helped countless individuals do brave things. John Fairbanks and other art missionaries parted from family and loved ones and traveled thousands of miles to a foreign country. Fairbanks went on to create an artistic legacy in his community and family, with several family members becoming accomplished artists. After a long and arduous trip fraught with suffering and personal sacrifice, Elder Hyde arrived in Jerusalem on Sunday, 24 October 1841. As he had seen in vision, he offered a heavenly-inspired dedicatory prayer. Oliver Cowdery got frostbite on his toes while traveling to Harmony to meet the Prophet Joseph Smith and withstood multiple criticisms for remaining faithful to what he had experienced as one of the three witnesses. He was rebaptized after leaving the church and died with a smile on his lips. 
Don Mullen overcame his trauma, anger, and dyslexia to write the best-selling book, Sunday Bloody Sunday, which later became an award-winning documentary as well. When the Soviet Union surrounded Berlin in June of 1946, the Western Allies supplied sectors of the city from the air. Gail Halverson participated in the Berlin airlift, carrying supplies to the people of West Berlin. A total of 101 fatalities were recorded, which included 17 American and eight British aircraft that crashed during the operation. Elder Scott endured multiple bad paintings before he st studied, received criticism, invested in quality art materials, and practiced to become a skilled watercolorist. Jerry, Jerry Pinckney drew to overcome dyslexia and racial profiling to become an award-winning children's book illustrator. I am grateful to have been associated with this university. I have met so many remarkable individuals in my tenure here. I am thankful for the students I have been privileged to teach and loyal friends and colleagues. I am grateful for family, parents and grandparents who have shared their extraordinary stories with me verbally and in letters and journals. I am thankful for parents who taught their family the value and the power of education and for a mother who read great stories to us as children, including the stories of Jesus. I am grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the Savior's life and sacrifice, and for the gospel restored in these the latter days. I am happy, I am thankful for the scriptures and for the lives of the prophets. I bear testimony that the Savior lives, that this is his church, and that we are led by living prophets, seers, and revelators. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.